Welcome to Mount Calvary. My name is Eric. We're so glad you're joining us for worship today. I love Psalm 107. Verse 1 says this, For give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His love endures forever. We have so much to be thankful for because God's love is for us. He loved us so much that He sent His one and only Son, Jesus, to be our Savior. So let's begin with a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your wonderful love and your grace for us. Lord, at this moment, we just pray silently in our hearts and confess our sins before you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his love endures forever. He loved you so much that he sent a Savior, Jesus, to die on the cross for every one of your sins. And because of Jesus, you are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first reading is from Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 8, all the way through verse 20. If you see the poor oppressed in a district, and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things, for one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much, but as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they carry in their hands. This too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. This is why I have observed to be good. That it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives some wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift from God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keep, keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel for today comes from Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be spilled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Welcome to Mount Calvary. We're in a brand new sermon series called More and More, and we're going to be taking a look at how you can experience more contentment, more peace through faith in Jesus. Now, if you could sit down with anyone, living or dead, and just have a conversation with them, who would they be? Who would they be and why? Would they be someone who's a celebrity? Would it be like Tom Brady? You'd want to sit down, have dinner with Tom, and ask him some questions? Uh, or would it be someone famous like from history, like Abraham Lincoln? Would you want to sit down and have dinner with Honest Abe and ask him some questions about how he uh, watched over the country as it was torn because of the Civil War? Who would you want to sit down and talk to if you could have just 60 minutes of conversation with them? Who would it be and why? On this All Saints Sunday, I would really enjoy uh, a conversation with my grandparents, really any grandparent, but in my side drawer, I've got some letters from uh, my dad's mom, uh, my grandma, and those letters mean a lot to me. Uh, they mean so much that like if our house caught on fire, I'm grabbing those letters and my wife and kids and we're getting out of the house, but those letters mean a tremendous amount to me because in those letters, I can hear words of wisdom from uh, a wise older Christian to a young person who's trying to learn how to follow Jesus. And in those letters, my grandma just shares some heartfelt and biblical words uh, with me, and they mean a tremendous amount to me. But for you, who would that be? If you were to sit down and ask uh, someone that you'd like to sit down with and ask them, you know, tell me a little bit about some words from wisdom. Uh, Tom Brady, how do you become a great quarterback? Abraham Lincoln, how do you become one of the greatest presidents of all time? If you were to sit down with someone like that, maybe a loved one, maybe a friend, maybe someone famous, what would you, your conversation be and why? Well, today we're gonna to take a look at a famous conversation with true wisdom, true wisdom from the wisest man that ever lived. In fact, his name was Solomon. And so we're gonna take a look at words of wisdom from Solomon. So if you've got a Bible, you can open it up to 1 Kings chapter 10. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. I'm going to give you the backstory of Solomon. Solomon was uh, incredibly intelligent, so wise that, in fact, uh, when he was young and he became the king, he prayed for wisdom. Uh, and during uh, his days, not only did he receive wisdom, but he also received wealth. In fact, as you look at 1 Kings chapter 10 and you bounce around to different sections, you see that Solomon, as he ruled over Israel, was incredibly, incredibly wealthy. It says that he would receive uh, 666 talents of gold. That was 25 tons of gold coming into Israel every year. Amazing. And then uh, with that wealth, the things that he did and the things that he accumulated were enormous. For example, he had 12,000 horses, 1,400 chariots. He had uh, 200 large shields hammered out of gold. And then he had 300 smaller shields hammered out of gold. Uh, he had a throne that was made out of ivory with overlaid with gold. I mean, it just, it said in 1 Kings chapter 10 that silver was practically worth nothing during Solomon's day. He had so much wealth that some historians calculate his net worth as 10 times the amount of Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. Think about that. Someone wealthier than Jeff, 10 times wealthier. Well, in the Bible, when Solomon was younger, he prayed for wisdom. And as he made his request known to God, he said this in 1 Kings chapter 3. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. And I love God's response to Solomon for this uh, really wise prayer. 
God said this, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never uh, have been any, there never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for both wealth and honor so that in your lifetime, uh, you will have no equal among kings. So God gave Solomon not just wisdom, but he gave him wealth and honor. And he was highly distinguished that so much that queens would come from other countries to just pay visit to see uh, Solomon and experience some of his wisdom. So perhaps if we were to sit down with someone who is really wise to give us some guidance for a day like today, uh, a guidance about what's, what we should do, how much is too much, maybe we would want to sit down with Solomon because clearly Solomon had everything that anyone could ever want. Someone who is worth 10 times more than the richest man in the United States uh, certainly would have, have wisdom in what wealth and the challenges of having such accumulation would bring to himself. Solomon was so wise that he wrote these words down for us to experience, to take in, and to take a look at in Ecclesiastes. And that's where we're going to go today. So if you have your Bible, you can open up to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. You can follow along with the words on our screen. Solomon gives some incredible words of wisdom as he takes a look at some of the problems of accumulating abundance, but he also gives some uh, observations and good things that he sees and how we should live our life. Now, this is what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. He says, whoever loves money never has enough, never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied, never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? You see, sometimes having increased wealth and abundance also increases anxiety and concern. And for uh, Solomon, he wrote this book, starting with the words meaningless, meaningless, everything is utterly meaningless. And yet, everything that he wrote in Ecclesiastes is not pointless. In fact, there are some really good points that we can understand, some things that we can learn from, from Solomon and his wisdom. Now, when I was 18 years old, uh, my family, uh, my parents had some good friends, and they would come over on weekends uh, to just enjoy company, share a meal together, enjoy laughs together. And they would come over sometimes uh, and really uh, with a pleasant surprise. In fact, one time they came over and the man has had a brand new Corvette a brand new 1993 Maroon Corvette LT1, tan interior, it had everything in it. So when he came through the door, and I was waiting there as an 18-year-old, he looked at me and said, hey, Eric, what are you doing tonight? And I said, nothing. He said, would you like to take the Corvette out on the town? And I didn't have to ask, he didn't have to ask me twice. I said, oh yeah. So I took the keys and I drove down the road, picked up a friend of mine, and we went over to Kimball's Ice Cream in Westford. Now, as we were enjoying our time at Kimball's, I had parked far away from everyone else at Kimball's. I mean, I was literally like 50 parking spots away from the next closest car. And as I was waiting in line uh, for ice cream, my mind kept racing back to that car. Like, man, I, I hope that sports car is safe because there is no possible way that I could ever pay for a scratch on that car. So my friend and I were hanging out in the line waiting for ice cream, and I think my friend was really looking forward to a Friday night where he could socialize and maybe talk to some girls. And I had to convince him that tonight is not the night that we're going to talk to any girls. In fact, tonight is the night we're going to hang out with a sports car. We're going back to the Corvette after we get our ice cream. So we got our ice cream and walking back to the car, sure enough, sure enough, someone had to park right next to the brand new Corvette with less than 1,000 miles on it. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, there's 50 parking spots between myself and the next person, and someone has to park immediately next to the brand new sports car. I was so concerned, so nervous about the whole thing, that my whole time eating ice cream, all I could think about was the car, the brand new sports car. And what I had experienced that night uh, proved out to be true with these words from Solomon, that an abundance 
of the good things, while they may be nice and beautiful and special and enjoyable, they certainly can bring a whole world of anxiety and concern upon yourself. In fact, I would have had a better time that Friday night in my old rusty pickup truck rather than the brand new sports car. Now, that being said, at 18 years old, the important lesson that I learned for myself was this. And King Solomon described it in verses 10 through 12, that nice cars, 12,000 horses, 1,400 chariots, 500 golden shields. All these things are nice, but they will never give you a rest of heart. Your heart will always be racing over what's happening to my 1,200 Corvettes or my 12,000 Corvettes or, or whatever you have. Your mind will always race. The only time that it will rest is when it rests in the Lord. And Solomon wants us to experience that rest. He knows what that rest looks like. Solomon wants to point us in a direction where we can experience that rest that comes through faith in Jesus. Now Solomon would go on in verse 12, and he would talk about how a working class man, a guy who just gets up and does his job and then goes back to bed at night, actually enjoys better rest than those who have way too many things. In fact, this is what Solomon says. He says in verse 12, The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. Solomon's writing from firsthand experience. A man with 12,000 horses, 1,400 chariots, he knows that when you've got way too much in abundance, you can't sleep very well because you're worried about who's going to park their rusty old car next to your brand new car. Who's going to take care of the nice horses when someone comes around with their junky old horses? He is concerned and he can't get goods rest. This is what he observes. That person that simply gets up, works a job that God has given them, gets a great night's rest, actually experiences a greater blessing in life than someone that's got an abundance of stuff that all their mind can focus on is the stuff rather than the gifts that God has given them. Well, Solomon talks about this working class guy, and then he makes some other observations. His other observations are summed up in verses uh, 13 through 17. Basically, he observes this. When you are born, you come into this world naked. You have nothing. And when you leave, you take nothing with you. Nothing can even slip through the eye of a needle. Nothing goes with you. You come in with nothing, you leave with nothing. You come in naked, you leave naked. And, and those are kind of the similar words that Job makes an observation about. In fact, Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return there. The Lord gave, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, there was a monk in the 4th century. His name was Macarius, and he was a, a monk that lived in Egypt. And while Macarius the, the monk was away from his home, which didn't have much to begin with because he was a monk, while he was away from his home, he came walking back and he saw a man breaking into, his, uh, into the monastery, stealing the very little things that he did have. And what Macarius did was next was really remarkable. He started helping the man who was stealing stuff take Macarius's stuff and load it on the back of a camel. And the man who is stealing Macarius the monk's stuff rode off. And what Macarius the monk observed was the same sort of thing. Naked I came into this world from my mother's womb. Naked I will return. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So for Macarius, for Job, for wise King Solomon, they make all these same observations that the things that we have, while they can be nice and they can be a blessing from the Lord, they are just things and we can't take them with us. So what King uh, Solomon does is he puts everything in proper perspective for us. And then he turns our attention. He gives our attention uh, to what is actually good. So drop down with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. This is what he says. This is what I have observed to be good. That it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during their few days of life, 
God has given them. For this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. So from King Solomon's perspective, he starts his book in Ecclesiastes saying, meaningless, meaningless, everything is utterly meaningless. And then he ends the book basically bookending his words of wisdom with uh, uh, words that say, fear God and keep his commands. And between those two sections, he repeats himself in a few different ways, basically saying, eat, enjoy some food, do the job that God's given to you, and be merry with that. This is what he says in chapter 2, verses 24. He says, a man can do nothing better than to eat, drink, and be, find satisfaction in work. This, too, I see is from the hand of God. Chapter 3, verse 12, he says, I know that there's nothing better for man to be happy and to do good while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. And in chapter 5, verse 18, he says, Then I realize that it is good and proper for man to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life that God has given him. This is his lot. This is a gift of God. In all of Solomon's words of wisdom, in his 18 Psalms, in his 31 chapters of Proverbs, in Song of Songs, and here in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, wise King Solomon, points us in a direction that's good and godly for our benefit. You see, Solomon had tried everything in life. He could afford to try everything in life. And so he gives words of wisdom for us so that we can be guided by God's word in that direction. Now, what Solomon's saying here is, is, is if you are blessed with goodies, if you have material wealth, that's a gift from God. Be thankful to God, enjoy it, and be blessed by it. But don't let that capture your heart. Recognize where that gift came from. It comes from God. And that's what Solomon calls it. It's truly a gift from God. Now, Solomon can say that because he knows what his early prayer was. He prayed for wisdom, and God said, not only Solomon will I give you wisdom, but I'll give you wealth and honor as well. So Solomon knew, he put into perspective the material possessions, and he recognized that material possessions, you can't take it with you. So put it all in perspective. And if God has blessed you in materially in that way, just be thankful that that is a gift from God. Now here, here's the truth behind it. Whether you are materially poor, materially middle class, or materially wealthy, God makes us all rich through Jesus Christ. I love what St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians. In chapter 8, verse 9, he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Now, Paul here is not talking about financial wealth. He's not talking about your 401k, your stocks and bonds and Bitcoin. No, Paul is talking about a greater, more important wealth. He's talking about a wealth that comes through Jesus dying on the cross for your sins. It's for all poor and miserable sinners like you and me that receive an abundance of grace lavished upon us, that you and I are wealthier beyond our wildest comprehension because of Jesus and his great love for us. The great American composer and uh, hymn writer, Franny Crosby, who's known mostly for her famous hymn, B Blessed Assurance, she wrote uh, some 8,000 hymns during her lifetime. And Franny, who uh, lived during the 19th century, she uh, wrote some 8,000 hymns, and yet, she was completely blind. During her lifetime, she was known to describe her life like this. I'm thankful that God had made me blind because if God had given me sight, I would have been distracted by all the beauty of the world around me and I wouldn't have had time to write these beautiful hymns to give glory back to God. Well, one of those hymns that she wrote was a wonderful hymn called Unsearchable Riches. And here's some of the verses from that beautiful hymn. She says, Oh, the unsearchable riches of Christ, wealth that can never be told, riches exhaustless of mercy and grace, precious, more precious than gold. You see, when Jesus looks at you, 
he pays attention not to the sports cars or the brand new Corvettes, but he pays attention to you. You're truly what's priceless. While we may stand in line at Kimball's for some ice cream, with our mind racing back towards a sports car or something else that we have going on in our life, when Jesus looks at you, the thing that he sees that's priceless is not the brand new sports car. Oh no, he sees the things that's priceless is you because he has enriched you by his grace and his mercy. He's given you something so much more precious than gold. He's given you himself. He so loved you that he went to the cross for you and poured out grace upon grace for you. So the good news for you and for me on this All Saints Sunday is that Jesus looks at you and he says that you're precious. You are so precious that you're worth more than gold. You're worth the price of the Savior dying on the cross for you. May God bless you as you celebrate the riches of his grace. In Jesus' name. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we give you thanks for who you are and what you've done for us. We thank you for the riches of your grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you.